The meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Board of Appeals, uh, July 25, 2000, um, is called to order. We are light one board member, our former chairperson having been called to higher duty. And until the uh, town council appoints an additional <coughs> member to the board, we will operate as a board of six. First item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from last month's June 27 meeting. Um, can I hear a motion from someone on the board for approval of the minutes? Move to approve. Uh, second, um, discussion on the minutes. I think there should be some additions before. Um, Comments for additions? Well, yeah, uh, second page, line 10. Uh, Mr. Fustaci stated his concerns about parking. I also uh, questioned egress and the, the physical structure of the uh, future uh, office or clinic. Um, and I'd like to see the minutes uh, reflect that. So you'd like to have uh, page two, line 10 state, Mr. Fustaci stated his concern or raised I raise concerns about parking and egress. Raise concerns about parking, egress, and another item, or just parking and egress? Yeah, I also recall um, uh, entry, entry to the... Um, entry to the residence? To the, the place of operation. Entry to the... Place of operation. Place of operation. And I say that because it, it, it is in the basement, uh, uh, and I think that, you know, that I, I really think the minutes should reflect that. So, page two, line 10 to be changed to read Mr. Fristasi raised concerns about parking, comma, egress, and entry to the place of operation. Other comments, additions to the minutes? Um, I had just two very small items. Um, as the condition for approval at the bottom of page two, line 39, um, that applicant maintain a state of main license, I'd like to add, as a physical therapist. And then on page three, line 17, um, merely a, a typo. Mrs. Armstrong spoke to the appeal citing C-I-T-I-N-G instead of S-I-T-I-N-G. Any other comments about the minutes? I have a motion to approve them as amended by the changes. Move to approve as amended. Second. All those in favor? Not having been here for the entire meeting, I'm not going to just pass on it. Um, show the minutes of June 27 approved by a vote of 5 to 0 with one abstention. Uh, Mr. Cronin. Um, next item on the agenda, old business. Do we have any old business to address? Hearing none, we'll move on to next item on the agenda, new business. Um, the only item of new business that we have on the agenda is to hear the appeal of Cynthia B. Is it Duchette? Duchette. Duchette, I'm sorry. Cynthia B. Duchette, 43 Richmond Terrace, tax map U17, lot 31 for a left side property line. Uh, which is the northerly line of the property. 
uh, a variance of 13 feet from the required 25 feet to construct a deck. Now we have, in support of the application for a variance, the application itself, um, we also have a memo prepared by the town code enforcement officer. Uh, Ms. Doucette, have you seen the code enforcement officer's memo? Yes. Um, okay. Um, his memo. You ought to clarify that. The, the, the chronological order, is that what you're talking about? Yes. Of events? That's just something I do for the record, so she didn't get a copy of that. Okay. Um, Um, can you provide her with a copy since we do have a copy and give her an opportunity? Um, you will eventually. You can come up now if you want. Um, we have as part of our packet um, a copy of the notice of violation in order to correct that was sent to you, Ms. Doucette, on July 14, 2000. Uh, from Bruce Smith, the code enforcement officer sent to you by certified mail. Um, did you receive that notice? Um, we also have, as presented to us this evening, um, an email, uh, um, yes, an email sent to the town of Cape Elizabeth yesterday, July 24, from Greg I'm not even going to try the last name. T S O P E L A S. Sopolis. Sopolis. That says, To whom it may concern, my name is Greg Sopolis. I own 21 Ocean Avenue and am an abutter of Cynthia Doucette of Richmond Terrace. I received notice of the planning board meeting scheduled for July 25 to review the Doucette application for a side setback variance so that they can construct a deck. With the majority of the lot sizes on both Richmond Terrace as well as Ocean Avenue being of non-conforming status, it is my recommendation that variances of this nature should be granted within reason, which would allow for increased lifestyle as well as improvements to the neighborhood. A similar variance was granted to 19 Ocean Avenue last year for the construction of a garage and greenhouse. I'm also exercising my power of attorney in speaking for my sister Martha Tsopolis of 23 Ocean Avenue, also in a butter. If you should have any questions regarding this recommendation, I can be reached at, and he gives us his telephone number. Thank you very much. Signed, Greg Tsopolis. Hard copy faxed as well, and this is apparently the hard copy that was received by fax. Um, we have um, also a letter, a copy of a letter from Adrian Murphy addressed to uh, Ms. Seal Simpson. Is Adrian Murphy here? Um, who is Seal Simpson? She's right over there. Uh, and did you provide this letter to us, Ms. Simpson? Yes. Um, the letter says, have you seen this letter, Ms. No, Doucette? Well, I'll let, I'll let you have a copy of this. Um, I may have an extra. Chris, do you have an extra copy? So we can give her. Well, let me read it, uh, Ms. Doucette, so that you're aware of it. Um, it's a letter from Adrian Murphy to Ms. Seal Simpson at 47 Richmond Terrace, uh, dated yesterday. Dear Ms. Simpson, you have a lovely property with very, desire with very desirable views of the ocean. The slider and deck you added really served to open up the living room, adding light and bringing the outdoors in. You have thoughtfully landscaped your yard with bushes and trees that currently serve as good screen to your neighbor's property. I understand that your butters have added a deck on the side of their property facing yours. Should a second deck, second floor be added to that deck, its close proximity would definitely have a negative impact on the desirability and marketability of your property. Currently, the view is screened with bushes and trees. If something happened to the plantings, a second floor addition would box in your house. While it is difficult to put a dollar value on the impact of the proximity to your property, it is definitely a safe statement. 
that your property's desirability would be compromised. Please call if you have any questions. Sincerely, Adrian Murphy. And this is written on the letterhead of Caldwell Banker Hardin Beecher um, Real Estate. And there's a handwritten note on here from uh, Seal Simpson, I assume, because of the initial CPS that says the writer said to tell the board that she would be glad to discuss this matter further with any member of zoning board. Simply read that so you're aware that we have that. And we also have the certificate of variance that was granted by the board apparently in November of 1996, on November 14 of 1996 for this property. So with that by way of background, uh, Mr. Smith, would you like to add any background for our benefit that would be helpful? Uh, unless you want, to, want me to go over the, the chronological order of events that took place prior to uh, Mr. Set applying to the board, uh, there isn't anything more I'd like to add. Uh, it's simply, um, it's an after the fact. Uh, variance request to have a to build the deck or to keep the deck that's existing at uh, 12 feet from the property line, left property line. Okay. Um, Excuse me. For the record, could uh, Mr. Smith uh, review the events for for the record? Sure. Please. Thanks. Um, July 7th. Friday, uh, Cynthia Doucet came into the office and applied for a building permit to build a deck. She had a copy of a variance approved for the proposed deck that was granted back in 1996. I informed her that I could not issue a permit because the variance was no longer valid. As the audience stated, the project had to be substantially completed within one, within one year of the granting of the variance. Um, she went on to say that, that uh, somebody in the office had told her that the variance was good. Um, the 96 variance was still good and she could get a permit and, and go ahead. Um, she went on to elaborate that she had somebody scheduled for the next day. Um, she asked if she get fined if she built a deck without a permit. I told her she would receive a stop work order and a citation for violation of the ordinance for starting work without the permit. She was also informed that application of the zoning board for variance would have to be submitted no later than Tuesday, July 11th. I had told her that she needed to get a new variance if she was wanted to do the deck. Um, I went on to tell her it wasn't a good idea to start the deck without the proper approvals. She took the application and left. Um, said she'd be in on Monday afternoon. Uh, July 10th, I got a telephone call from a neighbor questioning whether Ms. Doucette had a permit for the deck. I went to the property, found the deck had been built, he issued a stop work order uh, on July 11th, uh, posted it on the side of the deck. Um, she in turn called the office that afternoon, questioned the stop work order. She said she'd come in this afternoon, that afternoon to apply for a building permit and a variance, which she did. July 12th, I, I denied the building permit and refunded the application fee, and July 14th, sent out a letter the citation letter which accompanies this memo. In the meantime, she came in and, and requested a variance, so um, the letter explained that I would forego enforcement action until after the Board of Appeals ruled. And here we are. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, yeah, Mr. is it appropriate for me to ask uh, Mr. Smith a question Absolutely. this time? When, when a variance is granted, Bruce, does it say on the variance certificate that they, that they receive that if no action is taken within a year, then the variance is, expires? Does it state what, that on? What it says is that it's not substantially completed in one year for the date of, of variance that it, that it becomes null and void. Okay, that, that states it on the, on the certificate. Um, I don't know if it said it on the 96 certificate. But it, it tells, it says now um, on the current certificates, it says that. Well, 
Were you in office back in 96? No. No. When, when I was in 97, just as a, a point of information, uh, a similar issue came up, and it was, I know it was in the ordinance that uh, work had to be substantially completed uh, within a year. So whether or not people were, were apprised of that, but that issue came with the, came with the Viking nursing home, which yes. way back in 93. Yes, and, and we know it, and I know a number of applicants know it, but I'm just wondering if, if it states it on the application or the certificate. Uh, there was a question in this particular case, and I'm just wondering if, if, if it was on that particular uh, variance that was granted. Uh, Mr. Fristasi, I have um, a copy of the recorded certificate of variance that Mr. Smith supplied at the start of the meeting. Um, the certificate of variance as recorded does not appear to state um, that the project has to be substantially complete within a year. It does make reference to two different sections of the ordinance, but it's not the ordinance that we have now, so the sections don't match up. So there's no way for me to know, looking at this, whether one of those citations is a reference to the one-year rule. Uh, Ms. Doucette, um, you are welcome to present um, any evidence that you would like to the board. Um, either on your own or through any other representative or any witnesses uh, in support of your application. Okay. I have a copy of the letter that I got when I received the variance in um, 1996. And at that time, I received it in November. At that point, it was too late that year to have the deck built because you couldn't get the building materials and it was going into winter. Um, and then th after that, I had two daughters in college, one still in college. I couldn't afford to do it right off, and the handyman that I had been expecting to build it retired because of health problems. So these all, th all these things delayed having the deck built. Actually, it, was, it is a, a small deck. I was thinking of more as a replacement for the step that I had there. Um, and my understanding, after I got the variance, I, I got it in November, and then I went into the um, town office in the spring, and I spoke with a woman in the office who isn't there now, and I don't know what her name was. But I specifically asked her if the variance was going to expire, and she said, no, you just can't get the building permit until you're ready to have it done, because that, then it has to be done within 30 days. And that was my understanding of what was OK as far as the, um, the variance. And it doesn't specifically say in this letter that it has to be done within a year. Um, so I've been putting off having this done um, as long as I could because of the money and, and trying to find somebody to do it. And I finally did find somebody. Um, he's a, a friend of my daughter's. And I had him lined up um, for about a, a month and a half on the specific day to do it. In the meantime, in the last year or so, the step that was there had become increasingly wobbly and is, was rotten and was ready to break through and was a hazard. And I was, um, I was very surprised when I went into the zone, in to see um, Bruce Smith to get the building permit. I haven't done this before, and I didn't realize that, first of all, you need, really needed to get the building permit farther ahead. The fellow was coming the next day. I have Fridays off from work. That's when I do most of the things that I need to do that are outside of work because I work 10 hours a day, four days a week, and I don't have time on those other days. I also, I had been away before that. Um, so that's why I hadn't gone to get the building permit then. And I was anticipating it having, having it done, and I knew this fellow was, um, that's when he was able to do it and wasn't going to be able to do it after that for quite a while. So I decided to take the chance and have it done because I had already gotten the variance in 1996, and it's exactly the same thing that I had requested at that point, and I didn't think that it would be a big problem, although I understand it's not really the way you're supposed to go about things. Um, basically, I think I explained in my application why I wanted this larger deck. Um, there's two, two reasons. I want to be able to put a, a bench on there. I'm a home care physical therapist. I carry a lot of 
things for my work in and out of the house, my work bag, which is pretty heavy, plus some other equipment sometimes. Um, I don't work at home, though. I go to other people's homes, and I work for community health services in case nobody, people don't know what a home care therapist is. Um, I don't have a garage, and so it's a hardship with bringing my work things in and out, and plus groceries, especially in the winter time when I might get home, nobody else is there, and the door is locked, and I need to have, put things down. The other reason is that because my house is sideways to the road, um, the door off the living room, which I consider the front door, faces the water. There's another house in front of us, and then Crescent Beach State Park, but I consider that the front. Um, the driveway is near the door on the other side where I had the deck built, um, and I consider that the back door. But because it's sideways, I wanted a more formal entrance um, to face the road. So by having this size deck built, I'm going to be able, I have the steps facing the road now, and I'm going to uh, put in a, like a brick pathway along the driveway that will go up to the steps. And it's definitely much more aesthetic looking than it was. And I have plans to put in more shrubs and, and make it more aesthetic. And if anything, it's an um, improvement to the neighborhood. And as far as my neighbor, Seal Simpson's property, there's a six-foot stockade fence that goes along one side of my driveway on our property line. And she has trees, fir trees, on the other side, so it makes a, a wall of um, green. So we're definitely buffered and also have privacy um, because of the uh, trees that are there. She can't see the deck. Um, and so I'm not sure why it is an issue for her on this certificate of variance and when I got this I was just happy to get it I knew I couldn't do it right away I read the first part I, I put it away and I don't know I don't think I read or I don't remember reading a paragraph at the bottom which says the conditions of this variance are as follows to construct a two-story addition with a side setback of 20 feet instead of the required 25 feet um, this is not a two-story addition it's an eight by eight foot deck. Um, it's, a, it's approximately, I forget what I put down there, but it's like 20 inches off the ground. Um, and it has two steps up to it. It's not, a, it's not a two story addition and it's never going to be. Any questions? Did, um, did Mr. Smith inform you on July 7th that he couldn't issue a new permit because your variance was no longer valid? He did inform me, but I, I already had the variance from four years ago and I had somebody lined up and, that's, and my step was rotten and that's why I made the decision to go ahead with it anyway. There's no difference in the plan from four years ago to what I have had done now. Did you know that it was not legal to go ahead without a building permit? That it was illegal? Mm -hmm. I knew you were supposed to get the building permit first. I understood from Bruce Smith. But under the circumstances, I felt like I needed to have it done. It was a safety hazard, and this is when the fellow was available to come build it for me. But you did understand that it wasn't proper to do that without a building permit? He, he told me in all uncertain terms that you were supposed to get the building permit. I did understand that you needed the building permit. However, I could not understand why my variance was no longer good. When I had gone through this whole process, paid the fee, um, Xeroxed 100 pages of copies of everything that I needed for the zoning board members that added on another $10 four years ago, it seemed, it really seemed extreme to have to go through it all again um, for as small a project as this is. In part of your presentation tonight, you are trying to explain to us why a variance should be granted. Um, one thing we haven't heard from you is why your property cannot yield a reasonable return without this deck. Um, I understand that you have an occupation where this deck is handy. Um, I'm not sure why the deck is any more useful than the stairs. but. I'm, my question for you is... I don't, I don't think I really understand what, what that means, yield a reasonable return on your property. Uh, well, maybe I can help you out with that. Okay.
you mean if I sell it, why it'd be worth more? Or no, not quite that. I'm trying to su summarize it, and anybody else can jump in here. Well, um, I can probably jump in here. One of the uh, one of the standards, uh, one of the requirements uh, that we find to be true before we can grant a variance under the terms of the ordinance um, is that the land in question cannot yield a reasonable return unless the variance is granted. And the main Supreme Judicial Court has interpreted that clause uh, on a number of occasions to mean that you as the property owner uh, will have lost the practical, uh, that you will have um, incurred the practical loss um, of all beneficial use of your land if the variance isn't granted. It is a very difficult standard to meet. Some uh, writers have said that it amounts to, um, the denial has to amount to a constitutional taking of your property. In other words, deprive you of all use of your property. Has this changed in the last four years? The difficulty of getting it, of having meeting that requirement? Um, well, the answer to your question is a little more complicated than it might seem on its surface. The way you're asking it, the answer is no. Between the time of your application and four years ago, no. Between the time of your application and today, yes. But How for purposes of your application, the answer is no. How has it changed between the time of my application this July and now? I think one thing that has changed is the law court, which is a court that interprets these types of tests has issued more decisions and in issuing more decisions they've interpreted the standard that we have to use which is in the last two weeks in in no but in the last four years they have in one case that is most um right on point to this is roe versus the city of south portland in which case somebody had asked for variance they built something a structure the structure was not in conformance, and therefore it was not a legal structure, that applicant came to the Board of Appeals in South Portland and said, I know I built this, but I built it wrong, and I need a variance after the fact. That is what you are doing today. You're asking for us for a variance after the fact. That case, the court said, no, I'm sorry. You but cannot I give thought it. each town made their own zoning ordinances. So how can you compare Cape Elizabeth to South Portland? The standard is the same. It's the undue hardship. Mr. Backer was just talking about. Well, this about. is definitely an undue hardship. Well, that's and what we're I trying guess to that's find out. that's why we're so anxious to have it put on. Under the undue hardship test, which is what we are applying tonight, there's four factors. I started with the first factor, which is the reasonable return factor. And talking to you tonight, we are trying to find out why your property cannot yield a reasonable return without this variance, two, that the need for the variance is not due to the unique characteristics, or is due to the unique characteristics of this property, it will not alter the characteristics of the entire property, and finally, it's not a result of the action in which you've taken. We have to apply those four factors, so I started to walk you through those okay. with the, why your property cannot yield a reasonable return without this debt. Okay, well, I'd like to skip that one for now and go on to the other two. Okay, but we will have to come back. To okay. Um, the need for the variance is not due to the unique characteristics of this property and not to the general character. It is due to the unique characteristics of this property. Isn't okay. that what you meant? Well, so that's what I'm trying to find out. It, right, but you said it is not due to the unique characteristics. It is due to the unique characteristics. It is due to the unique characteristics of this property and not unique to the characteristics of the entire neighborhood. Okay. It is definitely due to the unique characteristics of this property. Um, as I said before, the house sits sideways to the road. Um, it's on, it's much closer to the end of the property where I have put the deck than it is to the boundary on the other side. And the reason, and, and it's, uh, it, it's unique to the property because of the, the way the house is situated on the land and also because of it, it's being sideways. And the driveway doesn't go anywhere near the door on the other side. The driveway comes right up to where this entrance is. And 
It doesn't alter the characteristic of the neighborhood whatsoever. Most of the houses in our neighborhood are very modest. There's a couple of houses that are not modest at all, especially the one that's right in front of me. It's um, 35 foot high, it goes to the limits of the uh, what's allowed with the zoning board it, with the um, ordinance. Um, my house is a ranch style house. Right now it has a flat roof, which I definitely like to get rid of, but I've been living with it for a long time. Um, and if anything, this deck adds more character to my house in, in addition to being very functional, as I explained before. Um, the other step was like about four feet across by two feet, I think. And there just wasn't enough room to stand, and, and it had a small railing on each side. I try to balance things sometimes. I bring a cooler in my car as well as my work bag, and sometimes some other things while I'm opening the door. And it wasn't, you know, they didn't stay there very well. And I'm, I'd be holding my bag over my shoulder, which is pretty heavy. Um, so it definitely um, is a hardship in that way. So anyway, it does, it does conform to the, it, it doesn't change the neighborhood. It is a unique situation. My house is located, the way my house is located is unique to the neighborhood. And that's why I need that. As far as why it can't yield a reasonable return, I'm still not really clear on the definition of what that is, but it was, the step before that was so small that it just wasn't functional at all. And it was also falling apart and rotten. It was a safety hazard to anybody that came to our door. Can you describe what those steps were that you had before yep. you put the deck on? They're wooden steps. They were built when my oldest daughter was a baby and she just turned 21. Um, I had, they were about this far across, platform was about this big, and there was a step going up to it. There was just one step going up to that, so that made a high step going into the door. With the new deck, it comes, here's the door sill, and then the, I don't know what you call this board that goes under it, but the new deck comes right up to that. and. Plus, the, the land's a little bit sloped, so there's two steps going up to the deck instead of one, like there was before. And it makes it a lot, the ent entry is a lot easier that way, I mean, because the steps aren't as high, each one. And I, I plan on living in this house a long time till I'm retired and have grandchildren and so forth, so I think it makes sense to build something that's going to be as accessible to me in the long run as, as needed as it is now. I also had put a couple of concrete blocks under the first step a couple of years ago just to keep them from sinking in, but then the platform was starting to sway, and, and it could possibly have gone through with somebody heavy enough stepping on it. Do you have any, pro any evidence or any pictures or anything to show us what the steps were like in their dilapidated condition? No, I don't. I was thinking of taking a picture, but I didn't get to that. Um, however, I believe that two people um, drove by my house and, and looked at the situation and the old wood was still there piled up. I'm not positive, but I know there were, there was one car that was park, not parked, but kind of um, stopped for a couple minutes outside, according to my kids. And then I came home the other night behind somebody and, who was obviously looking at my house and um, then moved on when I had my left blinker on to go in the driveway. So I don't know who it was, but I think it was somebody from the zoning board. <laughs> Any other questions for Mr. Set? Uh, it's a question about the characterization of it. Uh, you said it's, it's a, you're characterizing it as, as a deck. I mean, it's... It well, that wasn't my characterization in the first place, but four years ago I was told that that's what it was called if it was going to be an eight by eight foot platform. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it actually is a small deck, but I'm not planning, and I know this... Well, it looks more like an entryway. Uh, yeah, right. yeah. It was an issue for Seal Simpson four, four years ago the fact that I had put a deck, so so-called so deck on that side, this deck is not meant to sit out on and have company and socialize because the main part of our yard, like I said before, is on the other side of the house. It faces the ocean, and that's where we sit out. Yeah, that's so kind we have of a, company. Yeah, uh, that's kind of, of, of what I, I I looked at the deck today, uh, and I, I had a hard time thinking. I said, "Is that the deck?" I, I guess that was only eight by eight. Uh, you were one of the ones that went by? Uh, today. So. Oh, today? Uh, Do you have a New Hampshire license plate? No. <laughs> oh, okay. 
and somebody else came by. <laughs> How much further does the present structure, which I'm hesitant to call, call it deck, extend beyond what was there before? Um, let's see. About, well, with the, the deck was about uh, two or three feet, I mean the platform part of the step before was two or three feet from the doorway. And the one step was about uh, a foot wide. So it's about four feet more beyond, four to five feet. Four feet beyond what you had originally. Yeah, and the reason I wanted it out there was so that the steps, I wanted a little area for shrubs next to the house so that it wouldn't look more aesthetic looking. So there's an area like about this big. Here's the door, here's the deck, stairs come here. And there's an area here, um, the dryer vents there, and then there's a shrub. And so I wanted the steps right alongside the driveway. And this deck look, looks out on a six foot stockade fence, does it? Well, the, yeah. The, okay. The steps face the road, but the deck actually in my the back of that side of my house um, faces the six foot stockade fence and the fir trees. I'm still kind of concerned about this reasonable return standard, and I know um, you said you've been confused about it. Uh, part of the standard um, is that an applicant may have tried to sell the house as is and was unable to sell it at all because of the fact that this structure, the, the, the variance wasn't granted. So in essence, if you tried to sell the house without the, this 8 by 8 deck and was unable to, and then came ahead and said, look, nobody in the world will buy my house without this deck, I may be more convinced. I'm a little concerned, though, that you haven't, you haven't really tried to, I'm not saying you have to go sell your house, that, that you're, you can stay there. <laughs> But the idea is that nobody could buy the house, nor you couldn't get your money for this house because of the variance wasn't granted. The house is not worth a whole lot the way it is. It needs a lot of repair. Okay, and the, the step was part of it. Okay. It does, was not functional the way it was. Does replacing the step with an, the same nice, brand new size, four by two steps, would that have then created I don't would think have that would be um, as aesthetic or as appealing to a buyer. Okay, but that's not my question. My question is, would that have solved the repair problem? The repair problem? Well, yeah, you take out the rotten wood, you put in new. It could solve the repair problem, but there were a lot of other issues that needed to be resolved. But, but those aren't part of our standard and our job here today. I'm no, sure. but um, just last year, as Greg Sophilis said, the, cor the house that is our corners of butt. Seal Simpson, that house that he was talking about, my house, his house. Mm -hmm. um, they were granted a variance to put on a single car garage with a greenhouse in the back. Um, there's no hardship saying that you have to have a greenhouse or that you have to have that to increase the value of your property so it'll sell. I mean, that was just like a year ago that they got that variance. Do you have any more information about that? About that property? Yeah, I wasn't on the board, and I don't think our job. Yeah, I, I don't think we need to go into what went on with another variance on another property when we don't have that case before us. Okay, but so let's, yeah, I, I let's feel limit. Like I'm being put between a rock and a hard spot as far as trying to um, come up with the info, you know, or rationalize why I, why my house wouldn't sell as well without this step. The step definitely adds value. It is much nicer than what was there before. I don't think it would have sold as well with the old step. Any other questions? Mr. Fristasi. In your packet, you provided to us a mortgage survey plan dated 1992. And you had a sketch of the deck with eight foot, eight foot, and some other dimensions. Who placed the deck on this mortgage survey plan with the distances? I had the mortgage survey plan from when I went through a, um, I had a mortgage survey done for a refinancing 
at that point, and they did it. I, I think I might have added some of the dimensions that were out there uh, measured, but the, the site plan is from the mortgage company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I put these numbers in here, and it, see, it's on an angle, so it's not the same at one end of the house as it is the other on how far it is from the property line. That's exactly my concern, that you're asking for a 12-foot variance, and there is a dimension there of 20 feet, which looks like it's three-quarters of the way back, the rear portion of the house gets closer to the property line as you go back. This deck is so I question whether, in fact, you're looking for a 12-foot variance, excuse me, a 13-foot variance or a 14-foot variance, whether it's 12-foot uh, from, the, from the property line or 11-foot from the property line. I have a concern. I was on the board back in 96 when you came here. I'm the only one. Um, I have a concern of anything this close, uh, any, any addition being built this close to a property line that really, and, and, and the other question I ask, I don't see any, any uh, uh, iron pins in these points, and is this in fact a true property line that we're referring to, that you're making reference to in the 20 foot setback? Okay, first of all. I have, excuse me, I have some serious concerns about this, and you know, again, uh, give me an opportunity to advocate when you're doing something like this or, or when an application is, is submitted to us, I, I really like to have something better than a home buyer or a homeowner doing their own measuring. Uh, and, and this scares me. Um, the other thing, the other thing I, I, I have a question for Bruce on this one. What could she do to build this deck without coming before us. Any addition would have to come to us? Any, any addition bigger than what was existing? Does she have to come to us? Or can you grant her a variance down to 10 feet without having to come to the zoning board? Setbacks are 25 feet. Yeah. Would, do we have a 50% reduction? We have a 50% reduction of the required 30 feet. Of the, we have a 50% reduction of the required setback for a district. The required setback for a district is 30 feet. Okay. So she could go, yes, she could go through the 30-day waiting period, meet the conditional use standards, and get a reduction down to 15 feet, provided no neighbor or, or nobody came forward with the concern enough to justify right. A referral to the board. So that would be basically a five foot uh, deck with stairs or five foot including stairs? Depends on the measurement. Well, I'm, I'm saying it's, I'm, I'm assuming it's fi uh, 20 feet. Correct. feet. Correct. Okay, so you can do a five. That is, that is my concern, Mrs. Uh, Mr. Set, that, well, uh, that is this a correct number? Because if you come back to us, uh, when you sell a property or down, down the road or when you refinance the property and you're looking for an additional setback, this, this board's going to get very, very angry. I think they're angry now, but they're going to be very angry if you have to come back and say, I made a mistake. It wasn't a 12-foot. Uh, it's not a mistake. Uh, first of all, um, the building inspector that was here in 1996 came out to my house and measured and, and collab collaborated or whatever the word is with those measurements that I had on there. Secondly, Seal Simpson has her six-foot stockade fence exactly on the property line. Um, and so there's no doubt about where it is. And uh, what was your other question? Oh, the mortgage survey map. In 1996, that was considered appropriate. That was okay. And when I came in a couple of weeks ago to apply for the building permit, um, one of the things I was concerned about was I was going to have to put out another $85 between the $75 fee for the zoning board plus the $10 copying cost for this small project that I had already put out those amounts. And so I was told that I didn't have to do all that over again and that th the fee would be waived and they just made the copies here at the town hall. And that map was included with that and I wasn't told that that was not adequate. 
If I may clarify that point. Please, Mr. Smith, uh, do. What was said was that she, Ms. Doucette said that she wasn't going to pay the $75, nor was she going to make 10 copies. And everything was in the file, and we could use them for the application. She also went down to the town manager when she didn't get any results from me, and the town manager, based on whatever conversation they had, came to me and told me to make copies based on what she had told him and to waive the $75. So we only copied these because she wanted those records brought forth for this variance, not because we said these were legal, accurate documents that we would provide for her application. Thank you. But I'm wondering why, if the map wasn't adequate when I submitted the application, I wouldn't have been informed of that. Do you mind if I attempt to answer that? Um, if you'd I'll like to, I was just kind. going to ask if there are any other questions. I'll be Ms. very Seth. kind. I'll be very kind. What's happened in the past, and you alluded to a property in your neighborhood, people would like to maximize their opportunity for renovations or additions, and they've taken every inch possible, and in some cases, they've gone a little too far, and when they come to pay the bills, the mortgage survey is done, and they find, find out that the property is basically out of the building envelope, the area in which we've granted them, or that, the, that distance in which we've granted them, and they've had to come back to us. And because we've seen a number of these, we have asked the applicant to be more exact when they come before us to ask for a variance. And that's why things have changed since 96 to today. And I'm still strongly advocating a more extensive survey to eliminate even more problems. And that's why it's changed. That is why it's different now. So please, let's not keep visiting, revisiting 96. We're looking at today. We're looking at what's before us. When you're saying a more extensive survey, what do you have in mind? Getting a surveyor out to... At this particular time, at this particular time, what you've presented us is is acceptable. Okay. All right. Because I really, I mean, first of all, I think it takes a long we're not time talking, to get a surveyor. Yes, it does, and we're not talking a lot of money. We're not talking a lot of money, but we are talking being sure. And if a carpenter were to come out and measure, I think he measures two or three times before he makes the cut. Right? They're they're trying to be cautious so they don't have to go back and redo, it, redo a situation. And that's why we're asking to be exact. And that's why I have questions, because your measurement is not shown on the end or the point. It's shown elsewhere. In fact, there's no reference at all to 12 feet from this deck to the property line. All I see is 20 feet from the line to the, to the, the building itself and then a deck, which leads me to believe that it's 11 feet just because that, that property line in your back of your house, that it narrows. It's not parallel, exactly parallel. That's why I have a concern, because I don't want to see you back here asking for another, another foot. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Ms. Doucette, is there any other information that you'd like to present to the board, or do you have um, other uh, people with, who, with you who would like to present any information on your behalf? Um, well, I, a couple of my neighbors stepped in when I was, I realized after it started, I don't know if they want to speak or not. Would you uh, tell us your name um, and address, please? Gail Dransfield, 48 Richmond Terrace. My house is diagonal from Cindy's house. And we, we moved in in 1980. She was already living there at that time. The deck that was replaced was there when we moved in in 1980. I guess I was surprised that you are even calling this a deck. I, it, it's an entranceway. It, it does make it look nicer. The way her driveway is situated, it's impossible to have had an entranceway much different than this. I read the letter from Mrs. Simpson, and I can see her concern about a second story. Um, but for 20 years, I know Cindy is wanting to change her entranceway and has never talked about putting on a second story at that particular spot. 
And when we put on our addition, we had to put sonar, tu sonar tubes or so sonar tubes and could not have put a second story on without a frost line or a basement. There is no basement under this entranceway. There's just, I don't even know what is under this entranceway. It's just a deck on the ground. So I think this is a landing that you enter the house. Mr. Thank you. Mr. Chair, just for the record, a deck, to clarify this point, or whether it's a deck or a platform, a deck is an open platform. And unless somebody can, you know, I mean, I'm not sure where this is all going, but I consider a set of stairs with a platform for ingress, egress is nothing but that. But if you can place a chair and still have ingress and egress and it becomes a deck, that's how I consider the difference between a, a set of steps for ingress and egress and a deck. Um, well, for our purposes, whether we call it a deck or a platform or a landing, uh, does it make a difference? Is there a no, distinction no, no. there in terms of uh, what no. decision we make? No. I mean, it, it is what it is. Not, so I feel, We've probably I, all driven by and seen it, so whatever name we attribute to it, I think we know what it is that you have mm -hmm. built um, at your door. Right. Is there anyone else who would like to speak in favor of the application? Is there anyone here who would like to speak against the application? Um, would you come forward, please, um, one at a time? And if you would tell us your name uh, and address, please. Uh, I'm Jenny Panarese, and along with my husband, Ken Remitz, who is here, we own 19 Ocean Avenue. I'm sorry, could you spell your last name for us? Panarese, P as in Peter, A-N-A-R-A-C-E. We own 19 Ocean Avenue, which has come up a couple of times in the discussion here. Uh, I want to thank you for allowing us to come and voice our concerns and, and anger, because I am angry. Well, you're welcome. It is your absolute right to be here, so. Thank you. Uh, with the fact that uh, Cynthia went ahead and built the deck without a variance and without a permit, but before I voice my concerns, of which I have several, uh, I'd like to give you a quick history so you understand where we're coming from, my husband and I. In fact, we took time off from our business to take the five-hour drive from our home in New York to come to this meeting. That's how strongly we feel about this situation. About 11, we bought our house at 19 Ocean Avenue about 11 years ago. We bought it from a family named Huey, who we never met. But they sold, what struck us uh, very strongly was why they sold their house. They came before this board and asked for variance to have a garage, attached garage put on 19 Ocean Avenue. And Cynthia Doucette came to this board and I gather bitterly opposed it to the point that the board denied them the right to put a garage. They, according to the story we were told, felt so harassed and so upset by what happened that they sold the house to us, left Cape, and moved to the northern part of Maine. We understood that when we bought the house. It was disturbing, but we were new to the neighborhood. Uh, we rented the house for several years, but we had bought it for our retirement. And about a year ago, as mentioned earlier, we came before this board and asked for a variance to put an attached garage, a single car garage, uh, to house a car. And yes, we did also want it large enough to put a tiny greenhouse. Cynthia came to this meeting one more time to complain uh, bitterly about us building this garage. And at that time, what struck me odd was that she, and she complained, her complaints were, our property abuts her property on the southeast corner. Seal Simpson's property is the one that really abuts a larger portion. So we're on the southeast corner. Her complaints at that time was that this board shouldn't grant anyone in this neighborhood a variance because it was eating up the green space. It was impinging on her privacy, the quality of living, the value of the properties, pollution, and it went on and on. And I just stood here flabbergasted. Fortunately, the board this time very, handled the situation very professionally, and we finally did get our garage, but not without cost. 
because she complained so much about the setbacks, we incurred several thousand dollar expense to get a Class A survey, which some of you might remember, to guarantee that we would be within the setbacks. And we were told if, in fact, the garage was not exactly where it was approved, we would ask to be take, for it to be taken down. Strangely enough, we left this board satisfied, even though we ended up with the smallest garage that exists. I mean, if they increase the size of American cars, it will not fit in this garage. But we were satisfied because we developed a, a high respect for this board and how they handled the situation. Uh, it seemed your regard for the character of the town, uh, uh, your regard for making sure that the zoning laws were adhered, adhered to and protecting our property values seemed to also be very high. So we also developed big respect for Bruce and he helped us through this time. So even though we didn't end up with the garage we wanted, we were very satisfied. My concerns, and Ken and my concerns at this time are that if you allow Cynthia to keep the step and not pare it back down to what is reasonable, then I feel that the people in my neighbor, this little neighborhood and the rest of the Cape are going to, um, you're going to lose credibility. The people in this town are going to say, I could do whatever I want. And then I'll just go and I'll you know, cry hardship or whatever, and they'll say fine, because it's already there. And I think the respect that we developed and others in the town have is just going to go out the window. And it's, you work very hard to put these rules in place. Uh, I'm also concerned about property value, uh, that she has a whole building on the other side, she said, you know, where she could put a deck, and I don't see the need other than to repair the steps. I think it's going to affect our property values, with particularly uh, C.O. Simpson. And if, in fact, she's saying, oh, I'm not going to enclose this deck, and I'm sure that's her intention right now, but she could, in a year or two, come before this board and, and say, now I need to enclose it. And my understanding from this board, when we got our variance, and by the way, we were told verbally and in writing we had one year to build it that a deck becomes a room, and we were not allowed to put a deck on our house, and we accepted that. And if this deck was to get become enclosed, it would be right on top of our property lines. And I think then the issues she expressed about us, about privacy, and quality of life, and property values, all apply to the situation. And she has plenty of room on the other side to build whatever she wants. My last concern, and probably the real reason for being here more than anything else is the long-term ramifications of this decision you make tonight. We're, we have a very small neighborhood. None of the properties conform, conform to anything. We're all on postage stamp lots. And, and if you say yes to her tonight, how do you say no to the next person that comes down and asks for you to rewrite the code for them? And I know in your plate right now, we have that situation for someone in the neighborhood who owns a piece of property that they're not now able to build on. How will you tell that person's lawyers that they can't build after you agree to this? So in summary, I'm here to ask you to remind you that your job is to enforce the code and to protect uh, the character of Cape Elizabeth, our neighborhood, and our property values. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Panares? Thank you very much. Um, anyone else who would like to speak? And if you would tell us your name and address, please. Yes, Michael Ott, 16 Ocean Avenue. And would you spell your last name for us, please? O-T-T. O-T-T, thank you. And I live over on the other road to Motion Avenue, and I'm the oldest resident on that road. I've asked for a garage. I've asked for a shop in my wife's house. This was 25 years ago. I've got nothing. 
They turned me down on everything. And now you come around and you see these places being built, being erected. Uh, the house which Glenn Prentice owns now, he probably isn't familiar. They built a deck on that two years ago, or a year or two ago. And uh, that was on the ocean side that I believe the board made them cut two or three feet off of that uh, abutting property towards uh, Tinsman's when he built that. It was, I don't know if he had a permit, but it's since been sold and the owner is here uh, tonight just, uh, you know, that has the house now. And one other thing why I'm here is uh, Mr. Set on anything that's ever done in that neighborhood is always against, against, and against. And uh, why, I don't know. And I've never had a problem with a woman, but everybody that wants to do something in that neighborhood, she's always against it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ott. Any questions for Mr. Ott? Thank you, sir. Um, anyone else? Yes, sir, come on up. And your name and address, please. It's Glenn Prentice, P-R-E-N-T-I-C-E, -E, 18 Ocean Avenue. Um, there are a couple of issues I'd like to address. One is uh, that I think that it's, uh, I applaud the board that they're now making it clear that uh, variances have time limits and that they're not some kind of perpetual uh, right to do something. If that were the case, we should all go out and apply for them, and use them someday maybe. Um, but the particular uh, concern I have here, other than uh, the fact that this was done knowing that it was against the law and not waiting to see if that would be changed, is that uh, uh, if, if essentially that we do have laws right now, and, and presumably for good reason. Now, if the laws have bad reasons, maybe the laws have to be changed. But until they're changed, it seems to me that what we need is rule of law. What I'm concerned about is that uh, if this uh, can be granted, as has already been said, why not another, and why don't we have a rule of exceptions rather than law? So my concerns really have to do with uh, that we should be able to count on the law and have it enforced. Uh, I understand uh, and feel some sympathy to her expressed reasons, but all of us could have reasons that would be uh, valid reasons, at least for us, as to why we might want to uh, be able to uh, do something different with our property than the current ordinances allow. And so I, I don't think that uh, it can be judged on that basis. So, are there any questions? Questions for Mr. Prentice? Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Anyone else wish to speak? And your name and address, please. Seal Simpson. The address is 47 Richmond Terrace. Go ahead, Ms. Simpson. I, uh, my main concern was the, uh, the devaluation of my property and the, uh, uh, the resale value when I would have to sell it, which would be my only asset for survival at the time I retire, which I have already retired two or three times. And uh, however, sooner or later, that's going to be permanent. I'm 82 years old in three months, so it's just a matter of time, and years go by real quickly. Um, <clears throat> I took the initiative of calling a realtor in to help me with this decision, and uh, the realtor did find that uh, there was an impact on the resale value of the place to some extent by the encroachment toward my line. Uh, I would like to point out that in um, 1993, I built a deck on my house on the south side. Now, the line that divides us is my southern line and her northern boundary. And it's a long boundary. It's the longest boundary of any of the neighbors that are out there at all is the one between she and I. <clears throat> and um, so my house sits back from that line 33 feet. 
and she's only back, I forget you have the, whatever her house sets back, but it's less than 25 already, is that correct? Correct. Less than 25 feet already. Mine is back 33 feet. I wanted to build a deck. I came before the board to get the variance. I didn't have to get a variance, I'm sorry. I, I wasn't willing to endure the hassle I was sure I would get if I had come before the board to ask for a variance to make the deck nine feet or 10 feet wide. So I got a permit for an eight foot wide deck and uh, 17 feet long. I couldn't run it the whole length of my house because that wouldn't meet the, uh, <coughs> I would have to appear for a variance from the street end on that end as well as dealing with two sets. So rather than do that, I built my deck eight feet wide and I'm not sorry that I did. I'm very happy with the deck. I'm very pleased that I got it. And um, the, um, the thing is, um, very hard for me to understand how anybody could have lived on the Cape. I have not lived here 25 years. I've been in Maine 18 or 19 years. And uh, I never had to deal with zoning whatsoever in Connecticut because for the area I lived in, everybody had pretty well established places. My house was 200 years old before I gave it up. So the lines were clearly known to everybody. So I hadn't dealt with zoning. And I had only been here two years <clears throat> when I got a letter from the Zoning Commission at that time. That was in uh, 84, 1984, I believe. And the letter was for a hearing here in front of the board for Doucette's they wanted to put a tool shed on their property. And out of ignorance or out of the, what, my courtesy, whatever, I called the Doucette's and asked if there was anything I could do to help because I had gotten this letter in the mail. I, I just knew them, not, not as friends, but as neighbors. And I was told that uh, the only thing I could do to help them would be not to attend the meeting. <laughs> so I didn't. And, uh, but as I said, I volunteered you know, to help them get, as it turns out, had I known a little bit more, that tool shed is only two feet from my line, the back of the tool shed, which I think is an encroachment. As I said, it's my own fault. I take responsibility for that. I did not go down and dispute it. And I certainly had the opportunity to. I was advised by letter and so forth. And I respectfully, ask this board to uphold the laws that the town sets forth that we all have to live with, whether we like it or not, we all do what we have to do. And I think if all of us do, most of us do, I think that all of us should have to live, live by the same laws. Thank you very much. Any questions for Ms. Simpson? Um, is there anyone else who would like to speak? Well, yes, ma'am. I'm, I'm sorry, you'll need to come up to the microphone if you would, please. When uh, Cynthia said that the fence between Seal and her property was on the property line, Seal was saying to me, no, would you please elaborate as to where that fence oh, is? Because yes, I think that affects the, the setback. Yeah, Ms. Simpson, why don't you come up to the microphone, if you would, please? Thank you. The um, property had a fence on it when I bought it, but it was very old and rotten, and it was falling down every time the wind blew hard, or it went down a little further. And it was replaced in sections. <clears throat> the, there are five sections to the left, if you're looking at the fence, and seven or eight to the right. Uh, the ones on the right were done at, in one step, <clears throat> and they were put in by Ron Forrest. And I had to have it surveyed because, again, we had disagreement with the Doucettes about the fence going up. And so I said, well, and Ron Forrest didn't even want to put the fence up until I had it surveyed, and uh, because that's what the neighbors wanted. So I had Owens Haskell surveyed at a cost of $175 to me. And there was a pin that stayed outside for a long, long time. It was well over on the Doucette property, and that pin stayed there. And anybody in that neighborhood could tell you how many times they walked by and saw that pin where it was, and it was well over toward the Doucette, on the Doucette property, the pin that Owen Haskell put there. So it was not on, right on the line. Now, the lines don't run perfectly straight, but to the best of my belief, and Ron Forrest, he put that fence six inches inside. Rest my case. Board members, any questions for Ms. Simpson? Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak um, against the application? Yes, sir. <clears throat> and Ms. Doucette, you're going to be given an opportunity uh, to speak again. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Ken Lemons. 
the main concern that I I'm sorry, you're, could you spell your last name for us, please? -E -M -I -T -Z. And your address? 19 Ocean Avenue. Thank you. Um, my main concern is that the conditions for variance have not been met. And I don't see any reason for a variance when <clears throat> there is plenty of other ways to solve different problems. All kinds of different solutions exist for design problems, just as we found out when we had to change our plan. But um, considering that it's a, a two-lot two property, there's plenty of room to make other regresses and other decks and other spaces and entryways which are, can be designed to allow packages to be set down without inconvenience and staying within the limits. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any questions for Mr. Remitz? Is there anyone else who wishes to speak against the application? Um, Ms. Doucette, you are welcome to uh, respond to any and all that you have heard this evening. Well, I feel like I've been through character exact, <laughs> what do you call it? You know what I'm talking about, assassination. assassination. <laughs> and I'm really shocked, frankly. Um, I'd like to go back through the history a little bit because some of the statements have been, that have been made are not true. I do not recall them that way. And I don't know, some, I, some of the people are speaking through hearsay as far as the, what the current owners are saying that the prior owners at 19 Ocean Avenue said. The people that, this um, man that just spoke and his wife are the ones that live at 19 Ocean Avenue. They're the ones with a single car garage with a greenhouse on it that they had to go through the variance to, um, to have, be able to put that on because they didn't have setbacks. The former owners wanted to put on a garage, and to tell you the truth, I forget now whether it was a one or two gar car garage, I think it was a two car garage, and they also wanted to put it in a workshop because the man that lived there was handicapped and he liked to go out and work with his tools. I objected because my son at the time was only four or five years old. I would still object because there would have been noise involved. It was my son's room is on the corner of our house that goes towards the corner where their garage is and it would have been way too close. That's why I objected, not because I didn't want them to have a garage that would increase their, the usefulness to them, especially with his disability. It would just, there would have been noise from power tools and I found that unacceptable. Plus they were talking more like a variance of two feet from the property line for a garage, not for a, a entranceway, a step, an uncovered entranceway. Secondly, to go back a little farther in, in the history of that house, that house was originally a one-story ranch-style house owned by um, Tom and Carolyn Tinsman, and they applied for a variance for the property to put on a second floor. I think it's a very nice house. I think what the current owners have done to it have even made it better. However, after they, the Tinsmans put on the second floor, a couple years later, Carolyn told me they had gotten the the setback from Ocean Avenue, they had gotten the variance, and then they had the builders build it two feet closer than that. And the problem with that property is that it's a lovely house, but it's too much density for that property, and that was my objection to that. Okay, thank you. I think that this probably isn't relevant to our analysis I, well, under the undue like, hardship standard. No, but I um, feel like people have gotten up and explained why they thought I shouldn't do it, do this along with some character assassination and I would like to rebut that. Then can we keep your, any but, comments to your property okay. alone? We are, we're not considering any other properties tonight, just your then property. Then why were they allowed uh, to Ms. Miller, I, I agree. And like. Ms. Doucette, um, Ms. Miller's point is well taken. Um, I'm giving you a lot of latitude to respond because okay, but the, sure the comments in opposition them. went sort of far afield and we let them go. Uh, but I, can, I think I can safely say that what the board will consider tonight in its decision will have nothing to do with what happened in a previous request for a variance, okay. whether that previous request for variance was granted or denied. Well, then I'd like to talk about some points that Seal Simpson brought up. First of all, our tool shed is not on her property line. It abuts Greg Sophilis' property line. And we, there was an old metal um, tool shed on our property when we bought the house. And it was where the current tool shed is now. 
And at that time, my husband and I, we are divorced now, um, were young and naive. We didn't have any idea that we couldn't just replace it with another tool shed. And so we had a wooden tool shed, a prefab tool shed built there. And then the building inspector came and told us that we had to apply for a conditional use um, permit, not a variance. Because it doesn't uh, yeah, have any... Again, Ms. Doucette, I'm, I'm willing to grant you the latitude to discuss the, okay. the tool shed if you would like, but our real interest is Okay, the, the other point with Seal Simpson, she contends that when we first moved in, along our property line, we had a six-foot stockade fence and she had a six-foot stockade fence. They were like this. They didn't quite come together. Um, she sent us a notice at, or a letter asking if she could have that taken down and replaced with her fence, and she had a little map from the bank um, which she said stated that the fence was six inches over the property line on this back part of the property, not up here along the driveway where the deck is. Um, and the fence had been there for over 20 years. And Anyway, we said no, we didn't want to move that unless she could prove that it was over the property line and we didn't consider the penciled map adequate from the bank. So I understood a few years later that she had a, what they called a point survey done, not a survey of her whole property, but where the point is, this fence post is, that is the corner post for the four properties that come together there. So um, I, you know, I still, I, I don't know what her survey proves exactly, but it doesn't have to do with where um, the fence is along the, the, well, it might have to do with where the fence is along our driveway, which is out from the deck. But um, when I understood when she put that fence up that she was putting it right on the property line, her former fence had been farther in and she had a little pathway there along our driveway. Yeah, our, our concern is actually with the property line, not with the fence. Well, the fence is on the property line, and the point is that's where I measured to when I put the figures in the drawing. And that, that's why I'm bringing that up. Okay. And I know you don't want to hear irrelevant things, but it seems to me you've already heard a lot, and I have a right to defend myself. You do, and we're certainly willing to give you that right. Well, I don't know Mr. Ott. I've lived in the neighborhood a long time ago. I've seen him around, but I don't know him. Right now, there's a house next door to him that was recently bought, and there's a big second floor addition put on, which I would imagine they would have had to get a variance for, because they don't think they have setbacks. And I'm sure some of his complaint is because of that kind of thing. What I'm talking about with the deck is a much smaller thing than that addition or some of the other things that have been done in the neighborhood. I mean, this is, it's not noisy. Um, it's gonna improve the aesthetics of the neighborhood. Unless you're driving down the road along my house or you live right across the street, you're never going to see it. And so I, I don't know why there's, that some of these people that have come tonight have an issue. I guess that's all. Any other questions for Ms. Doucette? Uh, Ms. Doucette, you, I'm still having trouble understanding how you rationalized even to yourself going ahead with building this without a building permit. Um, I haven't heard. I had had the man lined up for a while. I had trouble finding someone before that. I knew that he didn't have time again after this for quite a while, and the step desperately needed to be replaced. So, so you believe that your convenience should override the law? No, I believe that because it was approved four years ago <coughs> that the same conditions were met and that it should be approved this time also. And also because it was a safety issue where if somebody came and put their foot through my step and broke the leg on my property, they could sue me. But, you, but you're, what you're saying to me in response is that what you believe should be the case should override what the law is and the requirement from building permit. I understood from Bruce Smith that I needed to go before the zoning board again and that I needed to get a building permit. And I know I didn't do that this time in the right order. But I also believed, I ha you know, I, I haven't read things in the Cape Courier or wherever about significant changes in the last four years as far as how things have gone with the ordinances. And I felt like the conditions were the same. And so for, and I thought that's what the people on the zoning board would think. 
I didn't for in any way suspect that there would be so many questions or potential problems. To me, it was fairly cut and dried, and uh, so that's why I decided to go ahead with it, because I had, I had done all the stuff, filled out the application, brought the map in, done all the things before, and, not, and, and things haven't changed. It's the same situation, and it's the same um, project that was planned before. I guess I'm still hearing you say that because you thought it was okay, it didn't matter that you did not have a building permit. I'm not saying it didn't matter. I'm saying that I felt, when I rationalized it, I felt that I needed to go ahead with it because it was a safety issue. And I also felt that because it had been approved the exact same thing four years ago, that it wouldn't be a big issue. I sort of felt like this was, uh, um, I don't know what the word is I'm looking for, but it was, I knew I needed to come through this. I didn't anticipate all the questions and the problems that people um, are, that they, they, they think are problems that they're bringing up. Um, I didn't try to do something, I didn't go ahead and do just whatever I wanted because I wanted to do it. I had specific reasons and one of those was, I, I, felt, I thought I would be in and out of here in like 10 or 15 minutes. I did, had no idea that I would be, there would be so much discussion and so much opposition and so many problems with it. You know, I, to me it was something that had already occurred. You look at the information from before, you see that it was approved four years ago. And the reasons why that I um, went over at that point, and I didn't think that it was going to be a big problem to have it approved again. That's why I came. Not because I have a disregard for the town's ordinances or the laws. Thank you, Mr. Sack. Um, is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to speak for or against the application? Um, all interested persons having uh, made their comments, uh, we will now close the public comment portion of the hearing and we'll open this for board discussion. Anybody wish to begin? I guess I consider this sort of a, almost a tempest in a teapot. I didn't realize it would be this quite this contentious. Uh, there was a four foot entryway before. Now it, the entry, it's basically an enlarged entryway as far as I can see. The deck is a defined term in our ordinance as, a, as an open platform. I suppose you could call it a deck. But I suppose you could call almost any entryway a deck by, by that standard. Uh, this is one of the problems. Uh, that the board has always had. Uh, as I said in, in a meeting we had recently, uh, in the eight years I've served on the board, I've seen one case that, that met the criteria for, for a variance. Uh, but we've granted virtually hundreds. Uh, we've allowed people to build two-story additions and violations of setbacks. We've allowed garages. Uh, we've allowed decks. We've allowed uh, a large number of structures to be constructed when the strict, the strict application of the variance criteria were not met. But in all of those cases, on the other hand, there was no objections from the neighbors that the uh, considerations of enhancement to the neighborhood, making the property more attractive, uh, making the neighborhood more attractive, w were considerations. And while I didn't agree with all the variants that were granted, I think that by and large the board has taken the position that uh, when there's no serious objection from the neighbors and uh, the improvements are basically minor and they, they were contribute to the overall value of the house and of the neighborhood that was sort of hemmed and hawed and closed one eye and squinted a little bit and said, okay, we'll grant the variance. Uh, in this case, with neighbors objecting, I've become of two minds that first I, I, I see it as a minimal I understand, I can see the reasoning of the board that was granted the original variance request. I said, this is, this is basically a big nothing and will enhance the value of the property and it looks nice and what's there is probably, I imagine it is basically unattractive and go ahead and do it. Now with neighbors objecting to it, uh, that that's, throws a new wrinkle into it. 
And I'd like to hear what the other members of the board have to say. Other comments? Bob, you, you made some very good points and uh, very well stated. Uh, I was a member of the 96 board. Um, I can't remember the outcome of the vote, uh, the, uh, the way the vote went, but there was some opposition at that particular time. Uh, one thing that stands out in my mind this time around is what is the exact distance that's being requested? Uh, as I recall, it was late in the evening and we kind of glossed over a few things back, uh, back in 96. It stands out right now, there is a question as to where the property line is, and until that is resolved, uh, I really don't think that we should take action on this. Uh, or if we do take action, then, you know, we, we have to understand that, that there may be uh, a discrepancy. But, um, Mr. Remitz did state that this does not meet the criteria, and I find it difficult in justifying granting a variance based on the four items here, because uh, we know that the, that the land or the property can yield a, a reasonable return. I mean, at least I feel as though it can. Um, and uh, there are other options. Uh, instead of going out eight feet, you can go five feet, bring the stairs back towards the, uh, towards the road, and still have a foot shelf to, to uh, place uh, uh, items on. So uh, this, is, this is not as easy as it appears, um, and uh, it's going to be, be hard to justify, in my mind, granting a variance in this particular case. Well, I agree that the measurements are troubling because we don't have them specifically to go. But I think that if we're leaning towards granting the variance, then the measurements become more imperative, as you said. If our sentiments are that the variance would be denied if it was going to be a four-foot variance or an 18-foot variance, then we really don't need to discuss the measurements. and We can, we can act on it tonight um, without the, having the more but if we're, go if we're going with the variants, then I think it is imperative that we do have them. Other comments? Maybe what we should do is just kind of go through the, the four-part test of the undue hardship and see how we come out on those. Well, we can, and we, and we will. <coughs> and if there's no further discussion, we'll do that right now. I'm, I'm not sure the distance of I brought up this point before about the distance from the property line. If you grant a variance from the property line, uh, a variance of 12 feet, or in this case, 12 feet is what it's being asked for, Bruce? It's a variance of, oh, what does it say? The setback is 20 and? 13 feet. 13. 13 feet. Now, that becomes the applicant's burden. Uh, if she goes to sell her house and you find that that deck is 10 feet from the property line, uh, the bank will not loan on it. So if, in building whatever, the property owner takes the responsibility of guaranteeing that the uh, deck is, meets the variance that if it was granted. So, and if it doesn't meet it, well then there's gonna be a major price to pay when it comes to closing time, as, as, as we've seen happen before with this committee. Uh, so I don't, that doesn't bother me as much. If we grant a, a 12 foot variance, then it's 12 feet to the property line, wherever the property line is. And it's Ms. Doucette's problem to, to find out where the property line is and not to build any closer than 12 feet. That part doesn't bother me. But Joe, is, we know what's going to happen and if, if it's not. And his point is well taken. I guess I would say I, I, I am trying to be sympathetic to the real possibility that Ms. Doucette honestly believed that the variance that she received four years ago had no termination date associated with it. Apparently there's no paperwork to substantiate that there was any termination date. Um, so I think that's a genuine possibility. On the other hand, Mr. Smith told her on July 7th that that was the case and that she then went ahead uh, even without a building permit to build it, and that, that bothers me an awful lot. Uh, so I 
Well, we can be bothered by that, and I think Ms. Doucette recognizes that she shouldn't have done that, but it's, um, I think it would be clearly inappropriate for the board to attempt to punish her in some way by acting against her application merely because she built without a permit. So I would like to suggest that the board not take that into consideration in weighing the various factors as to whether or not to grant or deny the permit. Well, why don't we I would ask then that the board consider the possibility that Mr. Sett may have genuinely felt that she had no time limit on her and that, in fact, she had a variance and has a variance that is still legal. Certainly, that's a possibility she believes is true. Well, she may very well have believed it to be true, but again, I don't think that that affects whether we grant or deny well, it, the, it would uh, only in the, the application. Sense would, I'd, I'd look at it as a possibility of us continuing the variance that she thought she had. Um, and we apparently don't have any uh, yeah. evidence that she has any paperwork that told her that the variance granted to her had any time limit. I don't think well, we. I don't think we have any legal position to grant an extension uh, after 12 months. So that shouldn't be even, you know, discussed. Um, I agree, Mr. Prustasi. In fact, there's, a, there's a, a body of law that puts all of us on notice the of the laws and regulations uh, that affect us, whether we're actually aware of them or not. Um, and in fact, um, there are cases that go so far as to say that if you call uh, a municipal or government employee uh, with a question and you get the wrong answer, um, you can't rely upon that wrong answer and use that as your defense. So if you call the IRS helpline um, and ask a question about the preparation of your taxes and you're given an answer and rely on that and file your tax return and you filed it the wrong way as a result, the penalty that's levied against you, um, you have to pay. You can't say, well, I relied on what someone told me. So even though, Ms. Doucette, you may have in fact been given wrong information uh, four years ago or three years ago or whenever it was that you may have inquired of someone um, in the town of Cape Elizabeth about the length of time you had uh, to build on the variance you were granted four years ago. If in fact you were given wrong information, uh, that was unfortunate, but you were not entitled to rely on it. How um, would I find out you, you are charged with knowing uh, what the ordinance says. So the point is, we're not penalizing you one way or another for having acted or not having acted, but we are required today to review your application anew based on the facts in front of us and based on the ordinance as it reads today. But I would think that somebody working in the, um, the town hall office would be aware of those. We would like to think that they are aware of it, and we're not... Um, it, taking a position one way or another as to whether you were or were not given uh, correct or incorrect advice. Yeah, may I offer a point of information here? Mr. Prasachi brought the, the idea of extending variances. In oh, 93 and 94, uh, the Bikesby Nursing Home had a, received a variance to expand. It had not done it within the appropriate time. And then the wetland zoning ordinances came in, and they would not have qualified under the new ones. It, to make a long story short, they asked an extension of their variance. I, could, I as chairman at the time, could not find a, in, in, any basis for extending variances, but I was advised by the town council at the time that it was well within our power to extend variances. So I don't know if that's – that was applied for before the other one expired, though, so I'm not sure it's on point, but it's something – that uh, the town council had brought, the, uh, the, uh, the town attorney had advised me is, uh, is within our power to extend variances. Well, shall we take the uh, factors one at a time? Um, can I hear a motion on the first one? Do you want a motion? I just, you just want to read it and, and See a show of hands and then uh, a motion after we uh, establish whether well, we, we can have do that by an informal yeah. poll. Well, let's take the first one. Um, the, uh, 
but the land in question cannot yield a reasonable return unless a variance is granted. Can we see um, a show of hands as to how many members of the board uh, believe uh, that standard to have been met in this case? You know. How many believe that that standard has not been met yes. in this case? Um, okay. It's like it is unanimous among the six board members that um, Ms. Doucette has not met the burden um, of meeting standard number one, that the land in question cannot yield a reasonable return unless a variance is granted. Um, let's go on to standard number two. Um, how many of members of the board believe that standard number two has been met, uh, that the need for a variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions in the neighborhood? three in favor and those uh, who do not believe that that standard has been met. It's like an even split three and three. Um, standard number three, um, how many members of the board believe that the burden has been met um, in showing that the granting of the variance will not alter the essential character of the locality? Looks like we have uh, five. Uh, in favor and opposed to that one, uh, one. Um, and standard number four, how many members of the board believe that item number four, that the burden has been met on that one, the hardship is not the result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner? Point, it does not assume that a hardship exists. So if you, fallacy of a complex question. Well. Um, your, your point is well taken. Um, that implies that, that the that first implies, three that implies criteria. The first three has been met, and without that, you can't, be, you can't even get to number four. Mm -hmm. Well, just for the record. Pardon? Just for the record, we do want to. I, I think for the record, we do want We need to. Want the, uh, the show of hands on that. Um, how many believe that she has met the burden of showing that the hardship is not the result of action taken by the applicant um, or a prior owner? And I guess I'm reading that now and keeping, Mr. Cronin, with your comment that unless the first three are satisfied, that the fourth can't be satisfied. That would be my understanding of it. So you're saying the hardship is the result of the action taken by a voter? It is not the case that the. I think what Mr. Cronin is saying, unless that there, the, the, unless there is a, an affirmative uh, meeting of the burden on items one, two, and three, uh, item four doesn't even apply. That there is no hardship unless one, two, and three have been satisfied. Mm -hmm. To vote either way on that, yes or no, it assumes that you, you, you recognize that there is a hardship. Well, that's one way of looking at it, but who created, who created the hardship? Does, is there a hardship? Well, she's here tonight. Yeah, but hardship is a, is, is a legal term. You have, to have a hardship if, if your land can't yield a reasonable return. Well, my interpretation is who caused the problem. My, my interpretation of, of, of yeah. number four. That's been the general. Exactly. And I've been on that side of the counter a number of times, too. Uh, who caused the problems? Who created the hardship? Who created the need? And right now, the hardship or the need. And right now, the, create, the, the way I see it, it was created by Ms. Doucette by, by building this deck. She could advocate that the zoning ordinance changed. She did not. But, but I, think what, 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 I think what Mr. Cronin is saying, that it, unless you have found there to be a hardship, in other words, unless you have found that the land in question cannot yield a reasonable return, then there is no hardship, and you don't even have to get to the question of who caused it. Yeah, the current, current existence well, I, I, I sat here last, last month listening to you people, and I kind of took a, a, a quiet uh, view of what you were saying. Uh, tonight, I'm not going to take that view. Uh, I think my, my thoughts were substantiated with memos and letters that you received in, in tonight's packet and, and comments that were made. Um, my interpretation of, of item four, and it's through my 
five years on this board, and plus my, my experiences in going for variances, um, is that we're talking who caused the problem, who caused the hardship. Can I just interject one no. thing? I think you have to Excuse me, excuse me. No, Public? it must just say not at this point. Yeah. Is the hardship caused by, by, by the introduction of setbacks? And these houses were built? It's, yes. Okay. I mean, that, that, is one, that is one thing. It is. Yes, by reducing the setback, she has a hardship. Um, and, you know, that could go by item to two. Yeah, item two. Hardship as, as a yeah. synonym for problem. But, I mean, that's, that's not the way that, that, I, that I interpret it. Okay. Uh, you, you may have that luxury to interpret it that way. But um, uh, we're not talking that. That wasn't discussed tonight. We're talking about the deck is already created, and we're asking for that variance to accept that deck. So therefore, the, crea the, the hardship was created by the applicant. No, it's, there is case law that we've gone over. That's OK. I mean, I'm, I, I'm, I'm stating my point, um, and I'll, I'll sit back. And I don't think we should discuss and your, this your in length. And your point is well taken. OK, I don't think we should discuss this in length, because it's not germane to the outcome of, of, this, uh, of this particular case. But Joe, based on your point um, that the deck exists today, shouldn't we be looking at this as if the deck has yet to exist? Yes. That she's yes. coming to right. us, that she yes. wants to build the deck? Yes, there's a great body of case law that says exactly that. With Mr. Fristasi's comments in mind, I still think we need to vote up or down, one way or another, on item number four. Um, so I think we had a vote on it, um, but let's try again. Um, how many do believe that the burden has been met um, in showing that the hardship is not the result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner? I'll vote for that. Uh, with the understanding that hardship is synonymous with problem. So we had two believing that the burden had been met on that, mm -hmm. and those uh, who believe the burden has not been met, four. Well, may I now um, entertain a motion on the entire application based on that? Mr. Chair, Mr. Knight, comment on number two, three, three tied, is that? What is, how, do we, how do we do that in the conclusions? Um, I believe that when uh, the vote is tied, um, it is uh, to be considered as if the burden has not been met well, that's what I thought, on a tie vote. Uh, we need a majority vote uh, for uh, an item to pass. I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion that uh, we deny the uh, the appeal of Cynthia B. Doucette um, of 43 Richmond Terrace uh, based on the conclusions. The land in, yield in question can yield a reasonable return. Um, the need for a variance is not due to the unique circumstance of the property and not to the general conditions of the neighborhood. The granting of a variance will not alter the essential character of the locality. And correct me if I'm wrong on this one, but the hardship is the result of the action taken by the applicant or prior owner. I'm sorry, what was your, how did you phrase one, the last one? The last one, the hardship is the result. <clears throat> well, and I'll change my vote on the one, other one because I thought, <clears throat> excuse me, I was voting that it was the result of the action, which will make that three and three. And that's a, that's a thumbs down on that one. That the, the hardship is the result of the action taken by the applicant or prior owner. The vote was um, four to two, saying that the app, the hardship was not. No, two to four. I'm sorry. Wasn't it two to four? That the okay. The hardship is not result. There was not the two result. Two four. The statement that's on the paper. And two four. And so, okay, so I'm changing my vote on that previous one. That was a four, so I'm going to change and go to the other side, 
and I'm saying that it was the action of the of the applicant. <laughs> Correct. So we we are three and three on the vote. Did you agree with the statement as it re as read? As I was one of the four. On number four, do you but agree? I didn't agree with. Do you agree with the statement as read? Mr. Chairman, as written, I mean. Uh, uh, I, I think I'd like to suggest that as to item number four, that there is a body of members among us who believe that number four is inapplicable, that it is moot and doesn't even require a vote. Um, I am among those. <laughs> um, Mr. Ms. Chairman, we, if the application can be can deny it doesn't meet any given one of the four criteria, uh, and therefore putting all of them into the motion to deny is, is superfluous, particularly when there's dissent aboard the board. If there's unanimous consent aboard, unanimous agreement among the board that the land in question uh, can yield a reasonable return. I agree. It fails. We, we can just vote it down on that basis. Right. So I don't, don't see the need to complicate it with, with, with uh, saying it fails on all criteria when there's not universal agreement about that. I hesitated before I made the motion. But, um. Mr. Fristasi, for simplification, would you modify the motion and limit it to item number one? How about if I make a motion that we deny the application based, in, based on the conclusions and the facts? Well, it, uh, based on the conclusion that what? The conclusions and the finding of facts. That Cynthia B. Doucette, the finding of facts basically is Cynthia B. Doucette is the uh, owner of the property at 43 Richmond Terrace. If Mr. Set were to appeal this legally and said, well, why was I denied? I think we have to give a reason. The conclusion should, the, the, be, I, I, should be documented itemized. how the board decided and on it. And you have universal yeah. consensus. Uh, can, we, can we have a motion from someone um, that the application be denied based on the unanimous find into the board that the land in question can yield a reasonable return so without the granting of a variance? So moved. Do I hear a second? You're still looking for a motion? Or <laughs> a motion. Well, I just There's a motion and second here, right? Uh, discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion passes six to zero. The application is denied, Ms. Doucette. What are my options now? Um, you can speak with the code enforcement officer um, Bruce, tomorrow or at his availability about your options. The options. Thank you. The finding of the, um, the conclusions were established prior to the motion. Is that not correct? We had, the in, we had the individual vote. We voted on all of them, as we procedurally should. Yes, we simply didn't present and, those by way of form motion. In the past, we've collectively said we've denied or, or approved the motion based on the finding of facts and the conclusions. Right. And yeah, I was I, just trying to simplify. Mr. Matters. Chair, point of clarification here. I, I do have to do a final notice. Uh, I, I, am I not to include the four conclusions or just one or... And, and Bruce is um, right. He, he's got to, he's got to, on these four items, we've taken votes, and he's got he's to pass this on to the applicant and say that the land in question can yield a reasonable return. And I think you have to put down the vote, 6 0. That the need. 0 6, but yeah. Six -0. The need uh, for a variance is not due to the unique circumstances because it was a 3 to 3 vote. The granting of the variance will not alter the essential character. We agree that it, it would not. Uh, but the hardship is a result of the action or is not the result of the action. It doesn't matter. Either way, it's three and three. Did we have a three to three vote on number four? I changed mine from then, on the four side then we to were even it out. Just for Bruce's record and clarification, hopefully clarification. The original vote was two in favor as it was written on the draft and four against? And four <coughs> against, and one of the fours changed the vote. So you're in favor of as it was written. Is that what you 
So we have a tie vote. vote. Two in favor of how it was written and four against of how it was written. Okay, and how was it written? The, the hardship is not the result? Right. How it was written on a draft is how it's done in the state language, and, and you... Is not the result. Right. Well, wait a minute. There's four... You're saying that she had no other options available to her, that she could not even build. The way I read it is the hardship is if she had no other options whatsoever, that she couldn't even replace the steps that were there. She had other options, so other options. there were... The, the hardship would be she can't even step out of her door. They would, yeah. can, we, can we clarify what the vote was? I, I think people. the vote as, as after Mr. Fristassi changed his vote was that we had three believing that the burden had been met as to number four and three believed the burden had not been met okay, well, as to number four. I'm not four. sure if he's clear. I'm not clear. I, I had heard that there were two people that said that the hardship is not the result. And I saw four people that the hardship is the result. And you were one of the four. And I was one of the four. But so I you're going to change it to, to be? I, I thought we agreed that the hardship was a result of rezoning. I did no, not stay with how it's written. And that's how Bruce is interpreting it is correct. That two, two voted for exactly how the, the, the state the That's what I understood. Used. Right. And mm -hmm. that the other four voted basically negating the sentence, saying the hardship is, is, the is the result. Now, Joe, you want to change yours? I'll revert back to the original vote. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry for two the confusion. So we're back to two to four, a two to four vote, two believing that the burden had been met on number four, and four believing that the burden had not been met in proving number four. Are we all agreed? Bruce, you're comfortable with what you need to uh, prepare uh, your notice? Those four conclusions, as stated, will, will be in the notice. Thank you. That concludes the application of Ms. Doucette. Um, the next item on the agenda are a couple of communications. Uh, first is a... Mr. Chair? Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I believe it as chair, you should direct the Ms. Doucette to the fact that she can appeal this to Superior Court. Um, I, that, that should come from you uh, at this meeting before she leaves. Do we have um, in the rules the specific time frame, time frame for appeal? 30 days. I'm sure we do. The question is where? give her that information, but I just think it should go from the chair that, that, they, that she does have that right. I don't think it says it in the end. Within 45 days, but well, I'm looking. I'm looking now at the uh, Board of Appeals manual prepared by the Maine Municipal Association, uh, page 40. It says an appeal to the Superior Court from a decision of the Appeals Board must be filed within 45 days of the date of the Board's original decision on an application. This means within 45 days of the meeting at which the Board actually voted on the application, right. even though the applicant may not have received written notice uh, of the decision. For an appeal which must go directly to Superior Court, the appeal deadline is governed by Rule 80B and is 30 days from the date of the vote, except in the case of a subdivision decision that doesn't apply. Okay. 
So, Ms. Doucette, my understanding is that you have 45 days from today's date in which to perfect your appeal to the Superior Court. Means getting a lawyer in me? To appeal the decision of this board tonight. Not to get a lawyer within 45 days, but to have your appeal properly filed with the Superior Court within 45 days. In Portland, you're talking about Superior Court? Superior Court, Cumberland County, Portland. I won't be making an appeal. I can't afford a lawyer. I'm a single parent. I've waited years to do things to my house. It's not in good shape. It's a small house. It needs a lot of work. This was one of the things that I could afford to make it look better, and I really needed it. I feel like I've been a scapegoat tonight. Four years ago, Seal Simpson came by herself, and I was granted the variance. This time, she gathered all those people together. This is a contingency of elderly people in our neighborhood that she goes around with and was able to get them to come here and speak against me. And I'm really disappointed in this decision because there is no reason for it. I definitely do have a hardship. I don't know why that couldn't be understood from what I said or from the people that went to look at my house. I did not create that hardship. There was a, the house is the same as when I bought it as far as the setbacks except for the current deck. I don't think what it means by creating a heart, that the owner created a hardship, that it means by what I'm asking you to approve tonight, it means by what was already there. And I did not create a hardship by what was already there. I think there was a lot of misunderstanding, and I think you're trying to make an example of me um, because there's been so many requests for variances because of lack of setbacks. And I honestly did not Ms. Doucette, realize we that Ms. Doucette, please. We've we've spent a lot of time on this. this I know, but we're I not really trying, don't think I've been Ms. heard Doucette. fairly, and I'm disappointed Ms. that Doucette, you compare please. yourself to the IRS as far as answering questions. I think in the past year the IRS has been brought up in the news quite a bit, and they are being taken to task as far as how they treat people. And I certainly don't want to think of the Cape Zoning Board as the same as the IRS in the way in their treatment of people. I think this is a totally um, irrational decision, and I think I've been totally made a scapegoat, and I know that there are plenty of properties in Cape Elizabeth where the people are granted variances for much, much bigger projects and with much more impact on the environment, and there was no reason for this negative decision. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Doucette. Moving on to the next item on the agenda. We have um, some communications. Uh, the first is a carryover that was deferred from the June 27 meeting. Uh, we have a June 7 letter from the town attorney, uh, Mike Hill. And the letter addresses two separate items. First was a proposed amendment to the rules um, of this board. And the um, second was simply um, a reply to a question that had been presented regarding the code enforcement officer's ability uh, to refuse an application if he deemed the application to be incomplete. Um, and the town attorney was advising our code enforcement officer that uh, he, the CEO, did not have the right to refuse to accept an application if it was incomplete, um, that the CEO's uh, responsibility um, is merely to pass the application on to us and that we then have the right to act or refuse to act on it based upon whether it's uh, complete or incomplete. I have a question about that. If the person doesn't specify measurements. Bruce has to advertise this to the abutters. How does he advertise it if they don't, and people have written down exactly what they want. You know, I want a variance to build this thing. Well, how much of a variance are you asking for? Well, I don't know. Uh, just go out and take a tape measure to some convenient point. And to me, that 
if, if somebody can't specify exactly what they want, I don't see how it makes how Bruce can advertise it to the butters can judge whether the, they, they they approve or disapprove of it. Bruce, do you want to comment on this? Well, uh, you know, it's only reasonable to assume that the applicant has to supply the necessary information to get it legally advertised for the board, and that would include the name, the address, the whatever they want to do, the distances, the property lines, anything that's pertinent to, to the advertisement would have to be part of it. Otherwise, they just couldn't advertise it and it wouldn't be heard. Right. Uh, it's either either, either so you, so there and they supply it, or if they don't supply it, then then it's not advertised. It can't be advertised, so it couldn't be heard. So then you can reject the prop an application if, if, if it's not complete in terms of at least the things that have to be advertised. I'm not sure rejected it is not being able to process it through the proper channels to get it to the board. I think that's probably the appropriate. Okay, because it, it sounds like you, you have no say the person says I want this and you have to pass it on to the board. Kind of thing. Well, so. I understand. I can I understand what it says. I don't know what it, what it says to me is that that if they choose not to supply information, uh, su supportive information to that variance that, that's, that, that's deemed necessary by the Board of Appeals, that, that uh, I can't make that determination, what's necessary and what isn't, that you have to make, the Board has to make that determination when it gets to your, in front of you at this hearing. Right. Excuse me. Bruce, I think in the past the Board has been reluctant to either table some, uh, a, an application or not accept it uh, because of it's been incomplete. Um, do you advise the people that it may be rejected? I mean, no, I don't, I don't say anything to you. Of course, yes, of course I do. I, I try to walk them through every step. Well, I think based on that information right there, and if we feel as though there's more information needed, I, I wouldn't have any problem in tabling something and sending them back to get more information. I know the planning board has absolutely no problem in referring it back to, uh, uh, well, the applicant to, to complete it. And I think in a lot of cases, it's going to save a lot of problems. And I, and I, it, tonight, reference was made to a particular property. And I recall sending it back, or, or this board asked them to come back to us with a, with a survey, because it was a tight, a tight um, uh, lot. And they came back and thanked us for doing it because the property lines weren't as they thought they were. And that was through a market survey. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm still, I'm still uh, adamant about, uh, you know, granting variances on these tight, tight lots to, to property, property owners that are pushing it right out. Like, well, we had one a couple of weeks, uh, months ago. Um, and... Uh, he was asking what for a four foot setback, and in reality, it was a 12 foot setback that he was looking for. And he was talking $150,000 plus. Now, what would have happened if he went ahead and built that uh, or made that addition and then came back into us and asked for uh, an after the fact variance? It makes it more difficult for us. So, I, I would have no problems at all in referring the application back to the, the applicant if it's incomplete because we can have some pretty ugly problems, expensive problems down the road, and I think this is what the board is trying to avoid. I think that's exactly what um, Mike Hill is suggesting we do, and Bruce, knowing, the, knowing what the board's desires are, can make it clear to the applicant what the applicant should present, and if the applicant chooses to ignore his advice and it's tabled as a result, um, the applicant will at least have been put on notice, have been forewarned. I know that when the planning board, before it takes up an issue, there's first a vote that to, to certify the application as complete. And perhaps we, that should be our procedure too, is that we look at the application and we don't act on it until we decide that, that we have, you know, all, all, the, all the boxes have been filled in and the explanation is given. I think that might save us a, a lot of trouble Say, well, your application is not complete, sorry. You can't process it, end of discussion. One, one big difference between the plan board and the Board of Appeals is, is that somehow the plan board has, has been able to convince the applicant, whether, whether it was through council uh, channels or not, that they need a, a site plan to the extent that it could 
90% of the time is a survey. Uh, we don't have that luxury. We tried to do that a year and a half ago, and the council told us, no, no, you're not going to require an applicant to go out and get a survey. That's, that's putting too much burden on the, on the applicant. We also tried to try to convince them that a sketch plan would work, which was about $500, not a full-blown survey, but something that's a heck of a lot better than a mortgage inspection plan. Mm -hmm. They also said no to that because if, they couldn't, if there isn't enough documentation for the sketch plan, the next step is a survey, and they didn't want to put that burden on, a, on an applicant. Unlike, unlike the plan board, who has usually developers and people who, who have the infrastructure to do great documents like that, we're dealing with an individual homeowner 90% of the time. And the town council felt that that was a burden that they didn't want to pass on to the applicant. So our, or your documents, your tools that you have to work with are on a much, <laughs> not a lower level, but a, a different level. And, and there's no easy answer to that. I, I appreciate uh, Mr. Kostashi's concerns. I mean, it, it's well spoken. There's been a lot of problems, but we tried our best to get this through um, to get something better than a mortgage inspection plan with to no avail. Uh, council said no. Well, how about the case such as the one we had tonight where whatever we were given as far as dimensional information was apparently fairly sloppy and not very quantitative as far as us to make a judgment even within a few feet of him. What's, what's the best way for us to handle that, or for you to handle that, for that matter, before it gets to us? Well, I don't think we should talk about that specific case. No, I'm saying a case like, a case where we have sloppy information provided this, to us to mention. I mean, without getting into that case, right. the circumstances whereby you got this application was somewhat different than what I'm, I'm able to tell an applicant that they need to provide, because okay. it came through another channel and we were told to pull out of the file and put in okay. this application. So norm normally you would screen that. Um, you normally that mortgage inspection plan, at least the addition that was put on there, would be scaled out to the scale that's on there okay. so that anybody could take a, 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 okay. a ruler mm -hmm. and say, yes, this is scaled properly, and yes, this measurement to the property line is mm -hmm. accurate to the scale. Right. You know, Mr. Chairman, I think that was your point earlier as well as that. It, Bruce, in his position, uh, is urging the applicants to be as thorough in their application as possible, pro providing those type of drawings, that type of information. But the onus is not on him to uh, determine the quality of their information they're providing. They filled it out, and hopefully they've done the best that they can, but it, he it does not become the gatekeeper in saying yes or no, we can proceed with this. They, you know, That's very right. often I send them if, if, they, if they're really sincere about, a lot of them are really sincere, a lot of them aren't so sincere, but if they really, really want to, to present it, they'll come back to me two or three times. I'll say, geez, you ought to clarify this point. You ought to get this added on here. You ought to, had not to have this on here because it, clear, it, it clouds the issue. I've had applicants come back and forth three and four times over the course of the two weeks before the meeting. Um, and those who, you know, some will want to do it precise and others don't seem to care as much. So they all get the same instructions, but how they, how they present it is still up to them. I can't draw it for them. And, and I think that's all Mike Hill is saying uh, right. in this June 7 letter. Just to, while we're on this subject the, the, um, of, the, of how we discuss or how, what I give them for a cover page, you know, you have got copies of the cover page, and we haven't yet to touch on that. Mm -hmm. What I'd like to do, if, if you don't mind, is because of the new practical difficulty standards that have come up, I've created a new cover page for that. I'm going back and I'm going to create new cover pages for everything just to really clarify every single point so that things such as the issue of when you have to start and all that will be on there so that when they first take the application, they can look down through. So I would suggest that that discussion of the cover page if, if, if be the board's wishes, that let me develop and refine that down to a, a better, even a better document. Uh, and then I'll bring it to the board for their review and, and, and comment. Well, that's fine. That would be great. Well, let's go on to the proposed rules. Um, my understanding is that the only change to the rules, and correct me, anybody, 
if I'm wrong on this, but I understand this to be that the only proposed change that is being made here is Section 5B2. Is that correct? That and the fact that they took out the word building inspector and, and replaced it with CEO, code enforcement officer. He didn't mention that, but that's But, but in terms of substantive change to the rules themselves, it's simply the addition of uh, Section 5B2 that says the applicant shall submit 10 copies of the application and any supporting written materials to the CEO at least 14 days before the board meeting. Late submissions shall not be placed on the agenda until the following month's meeting. That's correct. It's up for the board to address the case if we have an applicant who then presents information to us after those dates, right? I'm, I'm sorry? If an applicant comes before us who's already provided you an application that you've forwarded on to us, an applicant provides additional information to the board two days before the meeting. It's up to the board to deal how to deal with that then. It doesn't say all supporting document. I mean, that's what the, that's what it, the yeah, board would like I, to that's have. That's what I'll recommend that yeah. the applicant does. But there's nothing to stop the, there's nothing to tell them that they can't bring anything. Or I can't tell them they can't bring anything at the meeting. No, I know you can't. That's two days before. I'm saying it's up to the yeah. board to deal. Well, my concern is that we don't have a rule written in a way that provides argument for an opposition party. Uh, to argue that someone can't submit something new at the hearing. And I'm afraid that the way this is written, it says the applicant shall submit any supporting written materials at least 14 days before, um, might give rise to the argument that if somebody wants to present something to us for the first time at the hearing, that the rules suggest that they can't do that. See, I don't and, and I would, I certainly don't think we want to be that strict, that's and that's the, not the intent. I think that's the intent, no. I think what it means is that, that you want to see the supporting documentation, but I don't think it says that you can't. I mean, many times neighbors will bring in documents, and if you start denying evidence from the applicant, then you, you shouldn't take anybody from the neighbors either. So um, I think that stands for itself, but you know, we can fool around the wording if you'd like. Or I could run that by Mike for concern. Well, we're, we are requiring that the applicant submit 10 copies of the application. That's a shall. That's a mandate that they submit 10 copies of the application. We are, we want to encourage them to submit their supporting materials in advance of the hearing. But it's not a mandate. Is that correct? That's correct. The cover page does specifically state that failure to submit documentation uh, could result in the board tabling the issue or uh, to an earlier date, a later date. So, I mean, it does, it will, it does state that on the, on the cover page of the application that it's important that you submit supporting information there, and, and it could result in a table or, or even a denial. I don't think it says denial, but I mean, that would be up to the board. Well, I'm not suggesting that we necessarily do the redrafting of these proposed rules at this meeting. Um, but my concern in reading this was simply that um, there was the inference that um, an applicant would not be permitted to present anything new at the hearing. I, I'm a little concerned, though, if we make the language too permissive, we will be getting late submissions and we'll be faced with a stack at the, the night of the hearing. And I'd like to try to keep it such that the language appears to be encouraging them the 14 days. And I think that's why, why we put this in there. I think if, we're, if we alleviate this burden too much, we'll be, we'll be faced with the reason that we went to Michael Hill to begin with to right. talk about this 14 days. The, the reason he put this in was because he kind of sent the message that we wanted to encourage things. If we loosen it too much, we're obliviating the need for this message. Yeah, I mean, there's a difference between 
submitting a paper that one sheet to the board that night and, and, a, and a 30, 40 page document that could have been submitted, obviously could have been submitted at the time of application. So I think the board, board could make that determination at the meeting, yes, we'll accept this one. But, you know, if you've got 30 pages, we're not going to hear it. What if they did something about any supporting written materials in excess of four pages shall be submitted at least 14 days, or in excess of three pages? Kind of do a page limit just for the volume. Well, then you have to get into the size of the font and how many words they squeeze onto the page. Yeah, I think that the, the Could be five pages of pictures, you know? Yeah. I'm just concerned if we, we chop this up too much. The reason he's doing this is to help us, and we're not based on yeah, the staff. I, I know he is. Mm -hmm. I'm going to suggest to the applicants that they, that based on this, that, that they that they supply 10 copies of supporting documentation for the meeting, for the packets. I we mean, I'm not going to suggest it. I'm going to tell them that's what we need to do. Um, and if they question whether they can submit anything that night, I can explain to them that that yes, you can, but the board really needs time to review, and, they, and the, the applicant really needs to put together a packet for their review prior to the meeting. What if we propose to have supporting written materials 14 days, but rebuttal information could be submitted? What um, kind of information? Shorter time frames. I'm not sure that most people who come before the board would quite understand the distinction. And the paragraph speaks to the applicant, not necessarily those opposed to the appeal. Bruce, what is the current cutoff date on, on receiving uh, applications for the zoning board? Tuesday, the, the second Tuesday of each month. The second So it's 14 Tuesday, days prior to the... 14 days prior. Can, we, can I ask a question as to when you received the application for this past application? Was this a special exception? 99% of them I received the day that do. <laughs> oh, did you receive it on that second Tuesday or was it after? Because I'm looking at the dates and, and it looks like it was after that. No, I got it before the Tuesday. I don't know what the date was. but uh, Sounds like you didn't pick up the application. No, from no, no I'm just looking at, at which your documentation here. And... Um, we can't compare this application with regular applications. I, I need, I don't mean to repeat myself, but. I've he I, I heard you. I'm asking a specific question, though. It appears as though this one was received after the 14 day cutoff period. If you want me to repeat what I've already said twice, the town manager came to me and told me to pull everything out of the file and put it with her application when it came in and get it to the board. I did what I was told to do. If that date is after Tuesday, so be it. <laughs> well, it was it was advertised in time for the for the board. I can't really do any more than that. Okay. Do we want to we want to accept the language as written. I think we'd like to re, uh, digest it for the next uh, 30 days and bring it back to the next meeting. Uh, as far as receiving additional information, it doesn't come to us or it's not out in the mail until seven days. Um, prior to the meeting, um, I'm, I'm not adverse to having additional uh, information submitted. And again, Bruce is the one that should make the final call on, on this, uh, as long as it makes the mailing to us. Well, and be. under section four of our rules, um, it says that the rules can be dispensed with by a majority yeah. vote. So if, we can accept anything at the hearing. But if the application is going to sit around for seven days, I can't see why it can't be added to until that mailing. And I think my concern has been in the past that, that I'd like to get the information as early as possible so we can review it and ask questions, digest it, refer back to our manual. When information is given to us Monday evening or even Tuesday or even the <coughs> evening of the meeting, it's hard for us to, to look at it, ponder what's, what's been given to us, and... and uh, you know, apply it to uh, to the specific case. That's been my concern in the past. That's all. The, this application I'd, was dated 11th, so that was a Tuesday. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was but, there, but I mean... If it, I don't mind receiving, you know, photos, something reasonable that 
will not take a lot of time to, um, to read it and apply it to the issue at hand. So are you proposing that we table the proposed rules okay, until I'll, the August I'll, meeting? I'd like, to, I'd like to propose that we that table the, uh, the rules, the acceptance of the rules until the August meeting so that we have a chance to review them and uh, formulate additional questions and maybe even uh, additions. Second. Keep, it, keep in mind that, that this is better than what we had. And if we table it, we don't have anything. Um, at well, least this gives me something to, to for the ne next applications for next month. <laughs> and you can always amend this may, later. May I make an amendment to that uh, motion? That in the meantime, uh, the CEO refers back to these proposed rules to <laughs> accept new uh, applications and, and uh, formulate. Uh, well, we've gone this position. long without the requirement. We can certainly go another month. <laughs> I agree. Well, it was a concern of the board, so uh, that we get this language in here. It's too bad that we can't get something firmed up. If you're not comfortable with that, then... I don't think we're well, uncomfortable. We just want to think about it. Well, we'll ponder it for another month. Yeah. Well, all those in favor of tabling to August? Tabled, 6-0. Um, the next item is one that Bruce already referred to, and those were the cover pages that accompany applications. Um, and Bruce has suggested that we not uh, discuss these until he's had a chance to rewrite them uh, consistent with the practical difficulty standards. So we'll take that up at another time. Um, the other items that we have, not specifically on the agenda, but we have two other letters um, that were given to us in our packet. There's a July 5 letter from the town attorney uh, to Mike McGovern, uh, the town manager, um, informing uh, Mike McGovern of the board's decision last uh, month in the uh, matter of the uh, Armstrongs uh, and the Caputos. And the letter is really in here simply for your information. Um, the uh, purpose of the letter was to apparently put uh, Mike McGovern on notice that the board had interpreted the ordinance in a way that it had never been interpreted before and in a manner uh, that was more strict than the town um, and the CEO um, had interpreted it before, and stricter than the town's attorney had interpreted the ordinance before. Correct. So, I think the letter speaks for itself. Um, there is another... Uh, yeah, the point on it, uh, the board does have the right to interpret the ordinances. Am I correct on that? Yes, and in fact, the letter from Michael Hill makes it clear um, that that um, is the case. Okay. And is it your view now that we're bound to interpret all future uh, uh, issues regarding this on the same basis, having interpreted once that way? Um, And yes, uh, yes, unless we decide that that was an incorrect interpretation. Mm -hmm. We can change our mind. If we decide that we interpreted it incorrectly and the same issue should present itself again, uh, we can decide it differently. But it would be based on a, a, a determination that we were incorrect in the Armstrong and the, in the uh, Caputo matter. I see this issue coming up again and again as it would be an influx into Maine of uh, people buying the government property. And I just hope we we'll all stay on the same page with this. I didn't, I didn't vote in that matter, but I'm going to. I think we should be consistent in the application and our interpretation of the ordinance. Well, I agree. I think that we have an obligation to be consistent in our interpretation. 
unless we have uh, a distinct uh, reason or explanation for not being consistent. Yeah. Now, do but you find that binding on you, Bruce, in, in your issuing? Do you find this, the board's interpretation of the ordinance binding on you in the issuance of building permits? Oh, sure. Okay. That you guys are the final say. I will enforce what you decided. That's not a problem. But the letter makes it clear that it was within our power to make the interpretation we did. In fact, he says on page two, I advised the board at the hearing that reasonable minds could differ on the interpretation of the ordinance, and if board members were not convinced that the prior interpretation of this section by the code enforcement officer in this office was a plain reading of the ordinance, they could adopt a more restrictive reading, reading of the ordinance, which in fact we did. Yeah. That said, that, that doesn't mean that I defend the denial of the building permit based on your interpretation. Say that again? That doesn't mean I have to defend a denial of a building permit based on the board's interpretation. Doesn't mean you have to if I deny a permit based on your interpretation, that doesn't mean I have to defend the denial. Oh, right. Sure. And then the other letter we I have in our <laughs> the other, le other letter that we have in our packet is a letter to Bruce Smith, our CEO, from Richard Baker, the Shoreland Zoning Coordinator of the Department of Environmental Protection, um, commenting on the board's decision. Um, in the Armstrong um, and Caputo matter, um, essentially um, stating that the board has adopted a, re a reading uh, more restrictive than what the state has interpreted uh, in the past. And they conclude the letter by saying, while I understand that reasonable minds can conclude that the Cape Elizabeth Ordinance, in light of the Rockport decision, does not allow expansions of the footprint within the setback area. The shoreland zoning staff at DEP has not taken such a restrictive position. So, um, I mean, there seems to be um, an acceptance of the fact that uh, reasonable minds can differ on the interpretation of this. And although we've um, interpreted it one way, they have chosen to interpret it another way. And they don't seem to be saying that we are incorrect, simply that we, are, we have made a decision that is different the the way read it in the Rick past. Baker from DEP would never say that. He would just, he, that's the type of person he is. He, you know, he's going he's gonna to honor the, the board's position. He's not is he a lawyer? No, I don't think so. Well, the only person who's going to tell us definitively that we were right or wrong is the court. That's correct. And, and that presumably some court will get a chance to tell us. I find it interesting that. Well, only only if this is only if if somebody appeals either this issue, which they can't because the time correct, is or another issue. Um, and the only other sort of final matter is just in case you don't know, and I think you probably all do know, is that on July 10, the town council did adopt the practical difficulty standard um, in lieu of the undue hardship standard, which will present a whole other series of issues for us to consider. And variances are presented. That comes into play next month. Too. Um, it will come into play next month. Thirty days for applications, applications submitted. The applications that I'm as of August 10th will be under the, the, the for outside of shoreline zone will be under practical difficulty. That's correct. Can I ask a question? If, if people were denied a variance under the old criteria, it says that they had to wait a year before applying for another one. Can they? Do they have to do that to apply under the new criteria? I'd have to get a legal interpretation on that. No, they don't have to. I don't think they either. do. They do not. Well, I wouldn't think so if the criteria changed. Not in other communities. Well, if, 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 unless, if it's, unless it's a, well, I don't know. I guess I'd have to. It's, it's new information or a change of, right. of, of the law, and it's, I think that's what it says uh, in the procedure. That, unless, unless and, I, and I say this from firsthand uh, experience. If a change has taken place in some essential aspect of the case sufficient to warrant reconsideration, and I would think a change in the law would be that kind of a change. It would. Yes, I would think so. Any other matters to come before the board? Hearing none, can I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Adjourned. Okay. Adjourned. Vote.